What is up folks, welcome back to my second guide on Jurassic World Evolution where this time around we're going to be looking at 15 more advanced tips to help you have a little bit of an easier time when playing through this game. The video you are watching right now is a follow up slash part 2 of my first guide where we looked at 15 tips to know when getting started in the game. If you haven't seen that I will make sure to link it at the end of this video and also down in the description underneath. As mentioned in part 1, not all of these tips are going to be crazy useful to everyone but if we can teach even a handful of you guys one or two things then that is ultimately my goal and that would be awesome. Anyways, let's get into it. Okay, so kicking off this list, my first tip for you guys is to start submarine hatching your more advanced pens when possible. If you have no idea what I mean by submarine hatching, this is basically when you add a small sort of mini enclosure directly onto the side of your Hammond lab. The reason for doing this is so that you can use the same Hammond lab to release different dinosaurs into the same pen but not have them kill each other straight away. An ideal scenario when you would probably be doing this then would be in the early game when you don't have enough money to keep building Hammond labs on to every single pen and enclosure that you build. Instead, you can add this small mini paddock onto the side of your lab, use that area as a temporary holding bay, and then either release your dinos into different pens connected to the bay, or transport your dinosaurs across the park to another pen. For me personally, I just like doing this because it gives me a small time window in which I can release my dinosaurs and not have to worry about how they're interacting with the rest of the pen. Next up is a pretty straightforward tip that a lot of you guys have probably thought about doing but haven't actually done yet, and that is to just double layer your walls whenever you need to. When dealing with some of the more aggressive dinos, you can literally double layer some of your walls to give yourself a bit more room to breathe whenever bad shit occurs. If you guys care about a lot of the visuals and aesthetics of your park, you know how your park looks, then I understand that you might not want to do this. I mean, it can make some of your pens look a bit fugly. But one instance I would particularly recommend that you do this is during some of your missions. There will come a few points during the main story in which some of your officers are going to purposefully make you piss off and annoy your dinosaurs. During these missions, you will have to keep your aggravated dinosaur contained until the timer hits zero. If you are having a particularly difficult time with these tasks, or you're just trying to perfect the park with the most amount of safety possible, then this is just something that you can do. Moving swiftly onwards, one other thing that I try and do sometimes is to try and provide a path for my rangers by connecting multiple gates to the same pen. What I mean by this is, instead of just having one gate that your rangers go in and out of, sometimes it's just more time efficient to have two separate gates, one on either side of your pens. What this will do is allow your ranger AI to path a little more smoothly directly through the centre of your theme park. This then means that your rangers will be able to replenish a bunch of feeders in a row and allow them to complete their tasks and thus free up a lot more quickly. If you feel that you're constantly waiting on your rangers to return from doing one or two tasks, it is probably because they are finding it difficult to path from one objective to the other. Build more gates, free up your ranger routes and accomplish tasks much faster. Next up, I recommend that you guys use the management view to easily detect demand and bump up your park's rating. If you're finding that your facilities are not doing as hot as you'd like, you can hit C, go into your park logistics and identify which facility is pulling down the overall rating of your park. Once you come out of this menu, you can then use the management view to then see which of your attractions are starved of that particular service. Normally what happens is one of your hotels or dino viewing stands will be really popular and thus the demand for food and drink at that specific spot will be a lot higher. The same obviously applies for your shopping and fun ratings as well. If you're onto the park building stage where you're trying to refine and improve, the management view exists to help you identify the spots of demand and maximise profits. Coming in at tip number 5, I recommend that once you guys get to the later islands after the first one, you begin by building your carnivores first. Now, this could be deemed as a little bit controversial because in the first video I explained that you should be building a bunch of your herbivores as a quick and safe way to start your cash flow. However, now that you have a bunch of dinos unlocked and you're a bit more experienced on the way that things work, you might want to start off your park by building a few meat eaters. Although these bros are going to be a bit more expensive, it is often the case that the carnivores add to your park rating way more than the herbivores do. As we already know, improving your early game rating also improves your early game profits and therefore some evil dinos can really kickstart your park, obviously as long as you can keep these cheeky chappers in line. This point is particularly prevalent in some of the later islands in which you have a very very small amount of space. If you are feeling bold and you're not scared about the Hammond lab failing to create the carnivore, obviously it's going to be a little bit more expensive, then this can be a risky but very rewarding way to kickstart off your park with a bang. Whilst we're on the topic of park rating and trying to make your park the best it can be, another thing that you can do is obviously make your dinosaurs fight each other. Your overall rating is affected by the type and number of your dinosaurs, but also by the combat infamy stat. When a dinosaur kills another dino, it actually absorbs half of the dead dino's rating. This can be shown in the dino's total rating tab. So this means that if you want to bang up the rating of your individual dinosaurs, but keep the amount of total dinos to a more manageable number, then just hold a regular in-house UFC night every now and then. This is ultimately going to let you expand your rating whilst keeping your space requirements low. Just remember 
then that if your champion dino dies, you may end up losing a chunk of your park rating all at once. On the flip side, the main drawback to this point is that it can be very expensive to continuously create and then kill off your attractions. This can be an effective method of temporarily boosting your rating so long as you have the Skrilla to afford it. The next hint is pretty straightforward, but it can save you some time in a moment of crisis, and that is to open your safety shelters immediately when notified of an incoming storm. At first, this might seem a bit unnecessary to some peeps, but hear me out for just a second. Sometimes when a typhoon hits, your most unsettled dinosaurs can get a bit rowdy, and if your woes aren't strong enough yet, this can lead to some guests becoming a banquet meal for one. One thing I started doing was immediately opening shelters as soon as the storm warnings first came in. Most of the time, the storm passes with no problems, and it's an easy fix to quickly let your guests back out into the park, but for that one time in which shit hits the fan, you can save yourself a lot of stress. If you do decide to do this from time to time, just remember to close your shelters as soon as possible, because whilst they remain open, new guests are not able to enter your park, and your shelter protection rating is slowly going to drop over time. You don't want this. This is bad. Following up on the previous point then, I would also recommend that in some extreme circumstances that you knock out some of your carnivores during the early stages of a storm. If you have one or two big guys that you're nervous about dealing with during the chaos, then why not just send them for a mid-hurricane nap? If your power lines cut out and your ACU building becomes damaged first, it will be a lot harder to try and sedate Terry the T-Rex. You can start to see how this situation could snowball out of control if your rangers are already at the other end of the park. Alternatively, if you can be bothered, you could also manually fly your helicopter to the scary pen, I guess, and then float there as a safety precaution during the storm. Obviously, this isn't going to be that appropriate for larger parks when you have a fuck ton of pens, but for those of you who only have two or three paddocks just now, some of these strategies can help you save some of that early game revenue and prevent any mass problems. Alright, there's not much to say for this next one as it's pretty straightforward, but I would recommend that you use the money generating buildings to literally earn you free money. These structures are kind of low key OP in my opinion, and if you're neglecting them, then they're definitely worth looking into. There are three money gen buildings altogether one for science, one for security, and one for entertainment. If you're not very familiar, all these buildings do is generate money for you, but they also scale in efficiency based on your reputation with the relevant relevant faculty. The science and security ones are the cheapest and definitely worth investing in early if you want to. The entertainment building on the other hand is a lot more expensive but it looks really cool, which uh, kind of makes it worth for me. At the end of the day, all these buildings are pretty costly early on, but it just makes sense to grab them as soon as it is convenient. Once you pick them up, they're just going to perpetually generate cash for you and your park. Coming in at number 10, I recommend that you guys get into the habit of replacing all of your feeders in one pen at the same time. What I mean by this is, if you have two feeders in one pen and one of them runs out, just tell your ranger to replenish both of them at the same time. If you have another dino pen close by, I would even tell your ranger to go and replace that feeder as well. The reason for picking this strat up early is because it will save you massive amounts of time in the late game when you have like a million pens. Everyone who has played this game will know the annoyance of having to constantly replenish feeders over and over and over. In order to fix this constant stream of notifications, just have a system where you fix all your feeders at once. Doing this will mean that every so often you will have a mass wave of replenishments, but then at least you can select your rangers once and send them out to do a couple of journeys. In my opinion, one replenishment run every 20 minutes is much better than one run every two minutes. As always, you don't have to do this, it's personal preference, I would just highly recommend it. It's going to save you so much time. Next up, I recommend that you guys do your medicine research early on when possible. In the first video, we talked about some of the building upgrades that are available through the research lab, but we never really touched on anything else. The reason you want to focus on medical research is because at some point, one of your dinos is going to get ill, and if you don't have the correct antidote research, things can get a bit spicy. I had a couple of moments in my new parks where expensive dinos started getting sick and I hadn't even made the research building yet. In addition, there are a couple of missions in the later parks where your faculty dudes are going to purposefully make your dinos sick and then force you to cure them under a time limit. If you do your medical research early on, you can then bypass a bunch of this stuff later and save yourself some problems. One particularly cool thing you can do in this game is to actually use bits of the island and parts of the terrain to make a segment of your enclosures. For example, if you connect a fence onto the side of a mountain, you don't actually have to make a complete enclosure all the way around. The main benefits of doing this is that you can one, save money because you don't have to build a fence the full length of the pen. You also won't have to power it as long of an electric fence if you're housing some carnivores. And finally, 
doing this will give your park a more unique look as a few of your enclosures will end up looking a little different to the rest. This isn't anything groundbreaking, it's just a neat little trick that I thought I would throw in and you guys can do it if you fancy it. Next up, remember to manage the staff inside your stores and keep that faculty rating high. When the island grows and more guests arrive, be sure to add more staff to your stores and change up some of the merchandise that's being sold there. In the early game, money can be a little bit harder to come by so you at least want to ensure that your stores are profitable. Once you become a little bit more stabilised, you can then start to look at balancing profits with guest demand. If you see that one of your hotels has a high demand for food despite there being a restaurant right next to it, this probably means that the restaurant itself is working at full capacity. If this is the case, then add more staff members and rebalance your sales strategy. Normally you can fiddle about with the sliders until you find an optimal point of customer satisfaction and your profits. Appearing in our penultimate spot then is a reminder to design your enclosures with your viewing platforms and guest visibility in mind. I know you guys aren't as stupid as me, but more than once I've finished building a magnificent concrete dino pen, then realised that none of my guests can actually see anything inside it. When building, it helps to leave long stretches of fence for your viewing observatories, and then from here, I would then add paths, gates and extra bits around these. As an extra tip, if you do have a large enclosure that is inaccessible from one side, then make sure to place any feeders directly in front of your viewing observatories. I know some of this sounds simple enough, but if some of you forget to do this, then definitely try to keep an eye out in the future. I've messed up some of these minor things a few times now and it definitely helps to try and plan out a little before starting to throw about your fences. And finally, last but not least, I would recommend that you sell any annoying dinos left over from random quests that you don't want or need anymore. That's right, don't hesitate to get rid of any of the annoying fuckers if they're causing you any problems. Got a randomly aggressive raptor left over from the science quest? Bin his needy ass. Still storing that expensive Spinosaurus in the tiny cage because the entertainment team told you to? Stick that lad on eBay. On a more serious note, selling dinos in general can make your life a lot easier when trying to complete some of the last missions on each island. This seems kind of ironic and counterintuitive because the whole point of the game is to build dinosaurs, right? But if you get to the stage where you are killing it in funds but you keep getting annoyed by the constant notifications, do yourselves a favour and have a park cleanse. Sell off a bunch of your dinos, rearrange some of your feeders and maybe even consider moving important buildings. It will feel super refreshing to clean up your park and start some fresh dino life cycles. And that is us for this guide folks. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. As always, I'm super grateful for you guys stopping by. If you enjoyed the vid and or think that other people might find any of our tips in here useful, then feel free to leave a rating and support the channel if you fancy it. On top of that, if you feel like you have some inside pointers that I never mentioned here, then definitely share them below as well. I have been Jack, aka Mr. Wolfie, aka whatever you and your favourite prehistoric pals want to call me. Take care. And I'll see you guys next time.